Hello, um, welcome to the biology and medicine track here at Julia Khan. Um, our first talk today is going to be uh, Alex Long. You're talking about MRI compress, compress sensing and denoising in Julia. So there you go. Um, so yeah, I'm Alex. Uh, this is my first ever conference talk. Um, first time in the US, so lots of firsts. Um, I'm trying to learn compressed sensing uh, as well, and MRI is uh, an application of that. So I'm, I'm not by any means an MRI expert. Um, so I'm learning this topic as well. So uh, just a brief overview. Um, what made me interested in compressed sensing was uh, the fact that low rank applications are, are very common. Um, so uh, in the keynote, you would have uh, got a whole talk on matrices and sparsity. Um, and so this leads into it very nicely. Uh, so uh, compressed sensing benefits MRI to reduce data acquisition times. So um, uh, if you go into an MRI machine, you spend quite a bit of time there um, to get scanned. And so uh, uh, people are trying to work on this problem to, to make it go faster. And so one of the ways is to, to undersample the data. Um, and uh, because it's sparse, we can do a decent job at uh, reconstructing um, uh, the data and at the same time uh, denoise the image. Um, so yeah, that's what we're interested in. We're interested in uh, the speed, the accuracy of the reconstruction, and uh, robustness uh, if you're going to train machine learning models. Um, so our aim here is uh, identifying uh, fast lossy compression algorithms uh, with minimal uh, artifacts. And um, uh, Julia is a great framework for doing rapid prototyping and experimentation. So compressed sensing, what is it? Um, it's a signal processing technique for reconstruction from um, missing data. So um, you, if you have a, a matrix, um, uh, we're interested in underdetermined linear systems, so where we have uh, more um, unknowns than equations. Uh, so what makes sparsity work is uh, that we need to make some assumptions. So we're assuming that the problem that we're dealing with is um, uh, sparse. Uh, so in terms of uh, if you've got a, a matrix, it may look dense, but um, taking linear combinations will eliminate the uh, rows of a matrix. Um, so that's what sparsity can look like. And uh, incoherence, which is basically uh, the features that perform that reconstruction are uncorrelated. Um, so once we've got those two properties, um, that's a good application for using uh, compressed sensing. Uh, various e examples of where this has been applied is uh, matrix completion. So um, works by Jeffrey Hinton um, with the Netflix competition. So uh, rating of movies. Um, if you've got uh, similar people watching uh, the same type of movies, one person hasn't watched other movies of the other person, and uh, you want to see what uh, they may be rating those movies that they may not have watched. Um, Amazon probably does this. Um, yeah, uh, you've got a matrix of missing data. Um, compressed sensing could be used there. A uh, single pixel camera is uh, another application. So um, obviously your digital cameras, they are all CMOS uh, based uh, sensors. And um, you might think, oh, who cares about using compressed sensing, things scale up to more slow and whatnot. But um, when it comes to more niche applications where we are uh, sampling um, uh, beyond the visible um, uh, spectrum, uh, that's where these uh, applications may be um, interesting. Um, and then obviously there's MRI and a lot more. Uh, this field is um, not particularly new. The mathematics has been around for quite some time, but it has been sort of popularized in the mid 2000s by uh, uh, Candice um, Donahoe, Tao, and uh, others. Um, so hopefully um, you're 
know a bit of linear algebra here. So um, the SVD is a, a great starting point in terms of um, looking at uh, how we may sample uh, the matrix. Uh, so if we wanted to reconstruct a, a good approximation to A, um, the, the best we can do is uh, doing the singular value decomposition. So um, uh, all these, uh, um, A is the matrix, U, sigma is diagonal, V is transpose, they're, they're all matrices. So what we do is um, uh, we take the largest uh, singular values from uh, sigma, and then um, we take its corresponding columns and from U and multiply that with the, the sigma, and then um, the corresponding rows of um, V transpose. Uh, when we do that, we will get uh, the same dimensions as the matrix A, but it will be a, the best possible approximation to that. And um, if you read more about linear algebra, that's uh, sort of proven by um, urquhart young theorem um, that basically that's the best uh, rank K approximation. Um, if you're in machine learning, um, if you've done principal component analysis, uh, if you look under the hood, um, you'll find that uh, its implementation may be based on the, the SVD. So um, yeah, knowing a bit of linear algebra is good. Um, so MI reconstruction. Uh, general idea is um, if you've got some data set, so uh, I've used the NYU fast MRI data set here. Um, it's uh, read, in, read in as a H dot H file, file. Um, so it's a basically case-based data. Um, you get real and imaginary parts, so it's a so it's three-dimensional because there are a bunch of slices. So I just take one slice of that uh, case space, um, look at perform the inverse fast Fourier transform to uh, convert that case space into an image. Then um, what I do is uh, I FFT shift, which uh, takes the, um, the, the first quadrant, um, swap it with the, the third quadrant, and then the second quadrant with the fourth quadrant to um, reconstruct the, the image, and then perform compre any of your favorite compressed sensing methods to the noise further. So that's what the original image looks like um, on the, the left there. Um, once you do the IFT, IFFT and the shift. Um, on the right is the, the case-based representation of that image. You can, so if you do a Google, you'll see an image that maybe not looks like that, but um, uh, because the scaling uh, is uh, a bit off, but uh, you can see that uh, we've got a huge void of black space around. So what that's telling you is the, the, the sparsity, the inherent sparsity of this uh, MI application. And a lot of the interesting information is uh, captured in the lower frequencies. So that's towards the, the middle there. Um, so one of the first algorithms we look at is uh, singular value thresholding. Um, and uh, I think this is uh, based off the um, Emmanuel Candice's paper. Uh, so what we do here, um, very similarly um, with the, the SVD, um, but what we do is uh, for each of the singular values, the largest ones, we subtract um, a value lambda, which is arbitrary. And then, so that subscript plus there just means that uh, if we do this multiple times, we'll eventually go negative. And, and what we do is we take the, the, the maximum of that value. So we don't, we stay positive. Uh, we keep iterating over this uh, um, several times until we, uh, our reconstruction sort of converges. So we, we're no longer denoising any further. Uh, so that's what the, um, the image looks like after, um, in this case, the single iteration, uh, cho choosing a lambda of four, and then only takes about a second to run. Um, and note the file size as well as we go through um, these uh, algorithms. So uh, you expect the file size to decrease as we con continue to denoise the image. And on the left there, you can see the exponential drop off in the singular value. So it goes to show that you only need to sample the first K to do a decent reconstruction. 
um, if you, yeah. So uh, that, uh, the first thing to do is to, uh, these are hyperparameters, the number of iterations. Um, lambdas are hyperparameters, so you'll play around with these until you get an image that you like. Um, if you were a bit impatient and you don't want to iterate uh, numerous times, then set the lambda value uh, a bit bigger. And um, in this case, uh, if it's one, we have to iterate four times to get something of a similar, uh, a similar kind of image. And uh, yeah, again, that sort of shows that exponential drop off in singular values. Uh, also note the file size too was similar. Um, so let's move on to uh, iteration of this algorithm. Now, um, with the SVT, uh, if you denoise too much, you get sort of some blurring in the image. Uh, what we can do here to correct that is uh, uh, the blocked SVT. Um, so what we do is we take the SVT of a, of a, a sub part of the image, like a patch, and then SVT that across the image and uh, potentially overlapping uh, the patches as we move to the Im over the image. Um, and that's what that formula in, uh, describes there um, as we iterate uh, for each patch. And uh, it's a weighted sum of the, the patches. So um, uh, the more we patch up, the, the greater, uh, yeah, we divide by the weight there. And on the right there is just the hyperparameters that you can play around. Um, if uh, what you'll find is uh, some blocky sort of artifacts as a result of the, the block SVT, but um, the, the thing is that if you want to reduce on that, you reduce the, the patch size and then you increase the amount in which you overlap. Uh, so that's what you get. Um, the, the patch sizes there are really uh, fine. Uh, overlapping is really fine as well. Um, and there's a, obviously a trade-off with computation as you're doing more SVT sort of calculations, but each of those could be probably done in parallel so to speed things up further. Um, and so uh, finding that balance would give you a, an image like that. Um, and the file size, again, has, uh, is reasonably small. Um, I won't spend too much time on this one, but uh, Julia has uh, other uh, libraries that you can perform signal processing on, on an image. Uh, so here, I, uh, if you know the noise distribution of the MRI machine, if, it's, if you, uh, a priori, it's a Gaussian or Poison or uh, some other noise distribution, you can try to extract the, the noise out from the image uh, by performing a Wiener deconvolution. Um, you can mix and match these uh, sort of techniques as well. Um, Julia has a, a library that allows you to um, uh, save that image as a JPEG and um, apply compressed sensing on top of that uh, JPEG image to reduce the file size further. Um, moving on to uh, more advanced techniques. So um, uh, this total variation sort of uh, techniques. One of those is uh, anisotropic total variation. Um, there's a paper on that by Goldstein and Osher from UCLA. Uh, the equation is as follows. Um, you take the minimum of uh, uh, the image U, uh, which we're trying to reconstruct, uh, the, the sort of uh, gradient uh, with respect to X on U, um, and then uh, plus the great again on y, um, and then we have that uh, um, two norm term on the right, um, which is the uh, mu divided by two, um, and then the difference between the in the, the image that we started off with and the image that we're trying to reconstruct. So uh, the the value mu is again a hyperparameter that encodes how much you care about being too far away from the original image. Um, this is a particularly hard problem to solve because um, we've got some L1 terms. The first two terms are L1. Uh, the, the last term there is an L2 term, which is fine because it's convex, um, uh, differentiable. 
Um, and uh, what we do to uh, solve this method is um, the split Bregman method. So that's uh, probably falls into the class of augmented Lagrangian methods. Um, it's a sort of a special case of that. And uh, um, when you, whenever you've got L1 terms and L2 terms stuck there like that, which makes it hard to solve, um, there's a whole class of convex optimization algorithms called operating splitting methods you might have heard of, which um, basically sort of uh, solve each of those in tandem. So uh, solve the L1 first using some shrinkage method and then uh, moving to the L2 term, solving that and going back and forth. Um, so that's what the image looks like. Um, the original on the left, um, the denoised image on the right, and only took one second to perform uh, uh, a denoised image, uh, you know, to denoise that image on a single slice. Uh, obviously, there's some artifacts that result in using uh, anisotropic denoising. Um, such as uh, uh, it tries to preserve the, the edges of the, the image, but um, uh, yeah. There's another type of uh, total variation denoising called isotropic. Um, the formula is uh, pretty much identical. The only difference is that we don't have those L1 terms like we did previously. So um, the first term there is, uh, you know, two norm, um, the square root, and we take the sum of that, we put the, the gradients within that square root and sum them up and then the right hand side is again trying to uh, make sure that we don't go too far from the original image. And again, um, in the paper you'll find that this is also can be solved with the split Bregman method. Uh, so that's what we get um, between the two images. I haven't denoised them enough to, to sort of see what the differences look like, um, but uh, um, yeah. Okay, so some challenges is um, that I've got to work through as I uh, progress my journey in, into this topic. Uh, Hyperparameter selection, um, identification of uh, good metrics, um, uh, for, uh, trying to measure the amount of artifacts in an image um, it is a, also an ongoing research topic as well. Um, but what I've uh, done um, was to try to create a, a library uh, that is probably already published, um, micompress.jl. Um, it's in 0 0.0.1, so, uh, you know, expect it to be a bit buggy and whatnot, but um, that's the API there. Uh, if you do a simple import and then perform the compression that you want on the image, selecting the specific method and the files that you want to denoise. Um, and also the console output shows you the various metrics. Uh, they were selected based on another paper that I read, um, looking at mean absolute error, mean squared error, um, and probably something more interesting, uh, the SSIM or the structure similarity metric. Um, the variances there are, are, are zero. You might have noticed because I'm only doing it on one image, so uh, that explains that. Um, data flow. Um, so that's just pictorically what I'm described previously about how you take in an image and denoise it, um, and then there's obviously uh, some feedback loop that goes through the experimentation process of um, selecting your hyperparameters and cross-validating it if you're trying to train a model with this. Um, also another thing is a dashboard um, I've created which allows you to compare and contrast the various um, uh, algorithms that I've implemented um, and also tuning, ability to tune the relevant hyperparameters of that, of that particular method. Um, I've also tried to deploy this onto Amazon to hopefully show other people that may want to work with me on this library. Um, it's uh, Dockerized, it's got Julia inside Docker, so 
it and the dashboard is implemented with uh, Plotly JS, um, the Dash framework. Um, so uh, yeah, that's it's all in there. Um, and I've relied on a lot of project dependencies to make this happen. Um, so HDF5 to read the um, H5 file, um, FFTW to perform a fast Fourier transform, um, uh, Pluto, uh, which you could use uh, notebooks. Uh, so if you stick in your code there, um, it allows you to rapidly prototype. You just change the line and then it automatically recompiles and it's really fast. So that's one of the reasons I chose Julia because of that rapid sort of prototyping and um, speed that you get. Um, and all the other libraries that allow you to perform image processing um, as well. And we haven't covered, this is only scratching the surface of uh, MRI uh, image processing. It's a, it's a huge topic. Um, we haven't even gone into uh, looking at artifacts and we've just been focusing on how do we reconstruct the, the image, compress it down as much as we can, but it's trying to stay as close to the original as possible. Um, but uh, that's just a survey of techniques that I've found. Um, Autoencoders, if you're into neural networks, that can also be used to model nonlinearities um, in the image. Uh, and flux.js, you probably can work together with, uh, an implementation of that. Um, something I tried earlier was matrix completion via nuclear norm minimization. And I tried to shove that I tried to formulate that as a semi-definite program and then shove that into a, a generic solver that uh, could be used, but then it, it took too long because of the number of constraints that I was giving the, the solver. So uh, that would, number of constraints is bounded by the, the size of the image, each pixel, and it's like, nah, this is not gonna work, I'm not gonna wait that long. Uh, although it solves quickly, but the time it takes to put the prompt together just took too long and I say, yeah, um, there must be a operator splitting methods that would just iteratively do this uh, in the most cheapest and fastest way possible. Uh, some, that's a non-exhaustive uh, reference list if you want to learn more about each of the individual methods, uh, more about convex optimization. Um, uh, the Examples by Boyd are a good starting point. Um, Van der Berge, uh, lecture slides um, go into the advanced topics of convex optimization. There's a, a big book as well if you just need to get started um, on that topic. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, leave it for questions. So uh, have, uh, you were showing like metrics, uh, like file size, uh, et cetera, uh, for, uh, but especially with the denoising part, uh, have you uh, talked with physicians or worked with them yet uh, and have asked for their opinions or is that? That's the next step. That's, I think that's probably, I come to the conference and hopefully meet some people in that field, you know, um, yeah, so that's the next step. <laughs> I have a couple left to that. Um, I saw this, uh, you show the thing square error and the thing square error is quite important. I think there was a version of the, of, the, of the features. But then I'm starting to think that, especially for MRI, there are certain poses and planes where some regions of the picture are more important than others. And like uh, having sharpness at certain points is more impactful and you can be more lossy at our points. So do you think that a way to improve on that is to take that into consideration when you either calculate your errors or when you build your, your conversion techniques? Yeah, so I think the blocked SVT or you can probably just apply those uh, algorithms to a particular part of the image and do it patch wise and then um, uh, probably tune the uh, metrics so you know to based on what you've described to uh, reflect uh, the that kind of error. 
Uh, well, your presentation in the title has a lot about compressed sensing and the noising, so I guess there are two parts, at least three parts to the presentation, I guess. But about the compressed sensing part, uh, I won't interfere this, and we also won't, I don't particularly, but at least I've got an that works with it. And normally compressed sensing is in the sensing part, right? Normally you want to sense the data in a compressed manner and recover the true data, right? That's the, the whole idea about compressed sensing. But there is a theorem that unless this sensing is random, random, uh, it doesn't reconstruct the real data. Uh, and you, you show a lot of images about how you denoise data and you show the original image and the denoise image, but how that correlates to compressed sensing in the sensing department? Uh, because I, I think it's a still open problem today how to make uh, sensing, sensing devices that are random. And how, does, how is that done in MRI? Because I have no idea. Uh, I don't have any idea, too. Um, I, I think. Uh, you know, one way is to try to model the, the machine or the, the system introducing noise um, into the, the image and then uh, sort of see how you could um, apply uh, the techniques of compressed sensing and, you know, to ex or denoising techniques to pull out the noise out from the, the image. Um, does that answer your question? So using the... Normally, compressed sensing is only for the sensing part. Of course, you can try to see, make simulations and, uh, and try to apply compression techniques like my app. But normally, you have some kind of transformation function. You use FFT in your case. So you can be able to transform, you can be able to transform. Yeah. Any kind of transform that you can apply to the theorems of compressed sensing. Uh, I think you can wrap up, I guess. So these are these total variation thing you very but I have a question about Julia now. <laughs> uh, uh, you said that you deploy, and this is a very interesting part in the final, in the final phase of the presentation, that you deploy something with Julia in the AWS with Dockerized containers and stuff, right? And I always have problems running Julia on a container. I don't know if everybody has this kind of problem here, if it's not a single thing with me, but uh, normally the problem is that Julia installs everything in the .julia folder, the default folder, right? And if that folder is not writable, it complains. And normally, it's okay, but I don't know. How did you do it, man? I'm curious. <laughs> um, I think uh, I tried to start with a, a container and then shove stuff in randomly. <laughs> then, we, you know, it's like doing the thing that you know probably is dodgy, but, uh, and it, doesn't, it didn't work at the end of it. So what I did was just within the Docker file, explicitly say these are the dependencies in the uh, project.toml file and then um, uh, uh, tell uh, Docker to get Julia to um, uh, put in the files that it needs, like the H5 file that it needs to read. Um, and uh, that was, and then expose the port um, so that uh, because there's a web application, um, it's, uh, it was deployed as an EC2 container sort of instance. So um, once you've opened the specified that in Docker, uh, that this is the port that you need to uh, um, open. So when it gets deployed, then uh, you can navigate to the page. So I've done this probably a hundred times failing to get this deployed. Um, yeah. Go back on the comment about uh, MRI experience. I think the, the challenge you have with MRI images is that they've already been through a hugely noisy pipeline in the manufacturing before you the image is actually presented to the way you open it. I think what, what's much more interesting is you're getting hold of the, the raw data, the actual electromagnetic fields, and applying these kind of techniques to that data to see if you can do better than the, the hardware manufacturers. Um, I think if you ask me nicely, you might get access to that version, but they're not always a friend of this. Thank you. Um, so I looked at the fast MRI data set. I'm not sure whether that's raw data because. Um, no post. Okay. They're not <coughs> totally happy about giving you the. But you might be able to. I wonder if there are any buses that have MRI 
Yeah. There the probably are. If you took it apart and intercepted the place, you, you could. Uh... Right. Thank you very much, Alex.